Good evening, everyone. I'm Kurush Baram, the president of American Society of Geriatric Otolaryngology, and I'd like to welcome you to the fall edition of the ASGO quarterly seminars. Uh, we are very uh, fortunate to have a world-class speaker with us tonight, Dr. Sharok Jalisi. Dr. Jalisi is the current chief of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery in the Department of Surgery at Harvard Medical School, Beth, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. He's also the director of the head and neck surgical oncology and program leader for head and neck oncology at Beth Israel Deaconess Cancer Center, which is a member of Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center. He is also the residency program director uh, for the Harvard Medical School Otolaryngology program at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. He is an internationally renowned head and neck surgical oncologist and skull based surgeon with special expertise in robotic surgery. His research interests include outcomes of skull base and head and neck surgery and microvascular reconstruction. He's an author of an otolaryngology textbook and has written multiple book chapters, peer-reviewed papers, and so on. He has been an invited speaker at national and international venues. Dr. Jalisi is a graduate of Boston University Medical School. Uh, he completed his otolaryngology uh, residency at Boston University and received fellowship uh, training at Vanderbilt in cranial-based surgery. Uh, and as well as advanced head and neck surgical oncology and microvascular reconstructive surgery. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn the uh, platform to Sharok, who is an energetic and uh, very uh, creative young man. And those of you who know him and love him, you know how much energy he brings uh, to everything he does. Um, so Sharok, the platform is yours. Thank you for being our guest speaker this evening. Thank you, Koresh, and thank you uh, for the Society for inviting me. Uh, really appreciate it. I think uh, the work being done by, by the Society is, uh, is really monumental, especially as we face an aging population in, in our country and as uh, survival has increased. Uh, I think uh, management of the geriatric patient becomes even more important, especially with otorengology, where we have so many things we can offer our patients through our various disciplines. Uh, so we're going to be talking about outcomes in uh, geriatric head and neck uh, oncologic surgery. Uh, I think the important uh, parts of this uh, talk are going to be, uh, we're going to set the stage a little bit early on about uh, uh, why head and neck oncologic surgery is, is complex. Uh, and then we'll come on to the later half uh, onto the geriatric aspects of this and how we can get through this. Uh, I think uh, from, uh, firstly, I don't have any disclosures uh, to, uh, to tell. Um, so I think the, the beginning part of all this is uh, that when we started looking at this stuff, there was very little literature on outcomes in head and neck uh, on oncologic surgery on a national level. And this is about uh, nearly uh, uh, eight, nine years ago. Uh, and then we also developed an interest in seeing outcomes in academic medical centers. And then ultimately we'll talk about geriatric consideration and frailty, which I think is a very important topic for all of us in our various disciplines, especially in otorengology, because uh, we are getting more and more frail patients who are surviving, and then we have to think about do we operate or not, uh, and that uh, really falls back onto the surgical uh, surgical team uh, to figure out with our multiple specialties that we work with. We have a very good relationship with our geriatric service at uh, BI. We Beth Israel. We actually have a co-management service with our group, uh, and I think it works really well to manage uh, the geriatric patient because a lot of the things uh, that they bring to the table on management is something that. Uh, I wasn't trained or uh, we were taught. Uh, so I think it's, it adds a new dimension and uh, added dimension. And I would encourage everyone who's uh, on this call and, and the society uh, to engage the geriatric teams if you're not already doing that uh, for the safety, higher safety and quality of care that we can provide patients. So uh, starting off, head neck oncologic surgery is a very labor intensive uh, uh, specialty as we know. It's a high utilizer of hospital resources uh, that includes an intensive care unit, the operating room, uh, nursing, and then rehabilitation. Right? A lot of our patients may end up in nursing facilities post-discharge. And many complications can occur on the way. Um, 
And that's why uh, uh, multidisciplinary care can result in positive outcomes and lower morbidity and mortality. Uh, and we've noticed this with all comers, all age groups. Uh, and in particular, I think uh, the focus uh, being on the geriatric patient, having uh, multiple teams involved in their care, both inpatient and in the periop phase is, is, I think, very important. So very little data existed about uh, uh, national levels of complication comorbidities. Uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality had published 27 patient safety indicators that are tracked and can be used in hospital rating systems. And this thing's come full circle now. Uh, as you all know, a lot of the hospitals are now rated on a star system, and a lot of these uh, patient safety indicators go into that rating uh, for your hospitals. I think specialties like cardiac surgery now actually are, uh, are on a website where you can compare each service. I don't, uh, it hasn't happened to otorhingology or head and neck surgical oncology as yet, but I would not be surprised in a few years if that happens. And uh, several uh, conditions that are acquired during hospitalization are not reimbursable by CMS as of 2008. So it's been about um, 12 years now, 13 years that this has been ongoing. So it is in our best interest uh, to look at quality metrics and how we can uh, make them better. So the AHRQ patient safety indicators, uh, I've just put, that, put, the, put them down here so that uh, people can know them. They're still being used right now for quality assessment. Uh, but the ones that are highlighted are probably pertinent to otorhingology per se and, and head and neck surgery, postoperative hemorrhage, respiratory failure, uh, postoperative pulmonary embolism or DVTs, sepsis, and obviously foreign bodies left in, in the body or iatrogenic pneumothorax, uh, and then accidental puncture and laceration of patients uh, or transfusion reactions uh, or postoperative hemorrhage or hematoma. As you can see for the geriatric patient, all of these are pertinent, especially with sepsis, uh, and respiratory failure and PEs and DVTs, uh, because that can really, if, if someone already has comorbidities to begin with, this can really jeopardize them getting out of the hospital in a safe, uh, safe manner. Hospital acquired condition that could not be reimbursed by, uh, uh, by CMS uh, include everything we just talked about, such as foreign objects, air emb embolism, blood incompatibility, incompat pressure ulcers, stage three and four. So, you know, we have had a neck patients who may be lying in bed and we don't, uh, we're not thinking, or if we're not thinking about getting them moved or ambulated, they can get pressure ulcers that uh, come back and, uh, and affect the entire surgical team's quality numbers. Falls and trauma, again, uh, uh, things to think about uh, in all our patients, catheter-associated UTIs, and then obviously poor glycemic control, and then surgical site infection, not so for our services, because that's focused on people undergoing cardiac surgery or orthopedic procedures uh, or bariatric surgery. But DVTs and PE following uh, uh, procedures, and especially orthopedic procedures, is part of this. Hence, there was a huge interest in how do we mitigate this. And I think a lot of the hospitals over the last decade have created safety and quality officers and offices uh, to help us mitigate this. Now, obviously, while all this is going on, we are always thinking about re resectability as head and neck oncologic surgeons. And as time has gone on, uh, the amount we can take on goes up and up. Uh, so you can go in from uh, a tumor in the parotid that's invading your skull base, uh, and you can easily go in and resect that uh, mandible. You can you know, clear out the whole skull base. Uh, you can preserve the facial nerve. You can, the star is in the infratemporal fossa, uh, and you can do great surgeries. Uh, and there's a patient who had the entire ear canal and ear taken off uh, because of uh, skin cancer. Uh, but the question really becomes is, A, do we do the patients any favor? And B, are we able to get them out of the hospital? in a safe manner. So the Vision database uh, has been used uh, now, which is uh, formerly used to be called the University Health System Consortium. Uh, it's a, a greater number than 122 academic medical centers now, uh, but it, it takes in discharge level data. So it really includes uh, your inpatient data, length of stay, mortality rates, readmission rates, cost complication rates, and discharge disposition. And then it provides a risk adjusted expected value comparing the nation across these academic medical centers, uh, the length of stay, mortality, and cost so that you can account for differences based on the case mix. And uh, just a little uh, time on case mix index is basically when a patient comes in who has multiple comorbidities, they're considered a high case mix index versus someone who's coming in with no comorbidities. So someone, let's say stage four laryngeal cancer with COPD, heart failure, um, peripheral vascular disease is considered a higher risk category than someone who just 
a stage four laryngeal cancer with no other medical problems. And in general, we always thought that the more complex patients, or or, or as the academic medical center said, uh, we deal with the with with the most complex patients, uh, and hence we should be reimbursed more, and uh, uh, we utilize more resources. And this. Database also divides the severity of illness into four different categories, ranging from minor uh, to extreme. So we looked at about 22,000 uh, patients. Uh, we looked at the whole age range, and this is just setting the stage of why we ended up with geriatrics as our focus. Uh, and we looked at different level of cases, high, uh, high volume uh, centers were doing over 50 cases of inpatient cases. So you excluded thyroid and skin cancer, which is considered low acuity, Moderate were 21 to 49, and low uh, volume uh, hospitals are those that are less than 20 cases per year. We applied the ICD-9, which is now ICD-10, and remember the study was done uh, nearly nine years ago, um, and uh, a procedure code sport into head and neck oncologic surgery. So mostly extracting data for major ablations and reconstructions, and we got to about 11,000 patients. This is just a characteristic by, uh, by hospital volume, and as you can see, what we noted here was kind of startling, which we, we did not expect initially, that the majority of the patients who are over 65, 41%, and statistically significant, ended up in the moderate volume hospitals. So not the really high volume hospitals, which are the big centers, the big cancer centers, the big academic medical centers, but you know, uh, something in the community, uh, maybe safety net hospitals where, where, where a lot of these patients end up. Um, we also saw that uh, from a race perspective, uh, majority of the white patients ended up in the high volume hospitals. And then when you started adding up the, uh, the minorities, a lot of them end up in the moderate and low volume hospitals. And then from a severity of illness, which again, uh, you, you, you see uh, a majority of the moderate severity, which is the highest we got here, was in the moderate volume hospitals. From a pair mix, as expected, most of the private patients ended up in the high volume hospital. But at the same time, we're not linking them up to a high severity of illness uh, or a minority population. And, uh, and so when we looked at the comorbidity profile, it wasn't really statistically significant, but this is pretty startling that most of the government insurances would end up in the moderate and low volume hospitals. So Medicare, Medicaid, and any other classes of uh, Medicaid in the, in the state would end up uh, in these hospitals. When you looked at the outcome by hospital volume, it made sense. You know, the higher volume hospitals do well. I mean, um, the length of stay is shorter. The length of stay index, which is when, uh, when you look at the algorithm that uh, these databases use, they look at an expected value of length of stay, and then they look at what your observed value was in your institution for that particular patient. Uh, and the length of stay index was uh, lower in, uh, in uh, high volume uh, hospitals. And then the ICU utilization was actually lower in the high volume hospital, which all made sense because high volume hospitals have multiple teams working together to work on getting people from one uh, 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 clinical setting to the next. Uh, and that's why the length of stay was lower. Although this is not statistically significant, uh, the, the, the cost of doing business obviously also in the high volume hospitals was a little lower than everywhere else. We ran a regression model on this, and when you look at that, you start seeing that the complication rate uh, is lower in uh, high volume uh, versus the low volume hospitals. And what was startling here that we were really looking at, uh, hoping with the study that we would find that the geriatric patient would be the worse off. They would have the high mortality rate, the high complication rate. And it turned out we found these people in the 51 to 64 age group that had the highest mortality rate as compared to the geriatric patients. On top of it, our complications are highest in the black population, which I think is reported by many other, uh, many other publications since. And we had negative uh, relationship of, if you had a major severity of illness to complications, length of stay and cost. But if you were a private pay patient, your complication rate was lower, your length of stay was lower and the cost was lower. And you started scratching your head and saying, what's so special about private insurance versus Medicaid and uh, Medicare. And one thing we, we, we talked about in this is because a lot of the private uh, peers have very active services within the hospital, rounders and this and that, that help move people along to the, to the next level, which a lot of the Medicare and Medicaid uh, uh, products do not have. Uh, plus what we've noticed recently, and there was another study we did, where Medicaid has, uh, we, have, we have this now phenomenon of people who are underinsured 
or do not have post-discharge benefits that really expands the length of stay. And a lot of these moderate and low volume hospitals get affected by that. So what we concluded was in uh, here was lower complication in the high volume centers. The age 51 to 64, which was very surprising to us, had a higher mortality rate, higher mortality in the black population. And then as expected, higher length of stay, cost and complication than people who had worse illness uh, at a lower cost uh, and length of stay in the private payer group. So based on this, we also looked at say, what's the difference in comorbidities and what are the comorbidities that people would come in with head and neck uh, cancer in general uh, across all comers. And it generated a big, a big uh, uh, data basically. And basically you can see that the top five comorbidities that people come in with head and neck cancer. And we were, we were reporting this as so that it's a good learning experience for uh, our surgeons so they can watch out for this hypertension, metastatic cancer, COPD, uh, diabetes, uh, and hypothyroidism. Of these, really the ones that were uh, really significant uh, difference between the three groups were metastatic cancer, COPD, and interestingly, again, COPD was higher in the moderate volume hospitals. So suddenly you start seeing the trend that people with complex problems, multiple comorbidities are for some reason going into these moderate volume hospitals rather than as we had expected, academic medical centers, which are high volume uh, centers where they would end up at. From a complication perspective, uh, again, we saw that uh, we, we were interested in the most common complication we talked to our patients about, so DVT and PE. Uh, again, as you can see, head and neck surgery overall across the nation is pretty safe. Uh, your rates of DVT are uh, less than one and a half percent, and this is something that we quote uh, to our patients and encourage other people to quote as well, that DVT rates are low. Now, obviously, if uh, it allows us to have a benchmark that if systems or centers have a higher DVT or PE rate, I think that's an opportunity to improve those numbers by various interventions. Other things, post-operative acute MI is not that common. Again, less than 1% chance of a patient with undergoing major head and neck oncologic surgery will have a myocardial infarction post-op uh, uh, from across the nation. And the other thing we, we cared about was post-operative stroke and post-operative UTI or urinary tract infections. And again, these are less than half a percent. So overall, when you start thinking about we as a group, as a head and neck oncology or otorhinology group have done very well across the country uh, in minimizing these complications. And even though some people may quote the higher numbers, this is really what the national data shows for those centers that are contributing to this uh, data set. Uh, which happens through your coding department. And if you're, if you're part of it, then it's a, it's a wonderful tool to have. So going on to the next part was, well, what is the role of academic medical centers in all this? I mean, we have uh, head and neck cancer services. We have all kinds of stuff. So Bhattacharya, uh, uh, who's at Brigham and Women's at that point in time across the street from us, wrote this really interesting article on patterns of hospital utilization for the head and neck cancer patient. And basically what he concluded, and we'll talk about uh, this uh, in, a, in a second, is that population the greatest need of specialized care in institutions where systems are integrated. So we talk about big systems, integrated systems, systems like ours, Beth Israel Leahy Health, you know, uh, other institutions within the state, uh, and demonstrably linked to improve outcomes are least likely to obtain it, which meant that there's an access problem. And we noted that in our study several years before this, uh, a couple of years before this, that uh, patients with the worst severity of illness, who needed the most help, highest complications, comorbidities, were ending up in moderate volume hospitals, not in the high volume hospitals. So this whole discussion before that, oh, we're a high volume academic center, we deal with the toughest patients, was really going down the tube with a lot of the articles that came out after, after this in 2015 to 2017 and 18. So this particular study looked at the nationwide inpatient sample, looking at close to 30,000 patients uh, having had an inpatient uh, head and neck cancer stay. Uh, payer status uh, did not really change for the teaching institution, uh, but the proportion of Medicaid patients went up in the non-teaching institution. Most remember, most non-teaching institutions are those low volume community hospitals where patients may end up for one reason or other, don't have access into the bigger hospitals. Uh, and then both teaching and non-teaching institutions are an increase in the proportion of prior irradiated cases. And we think this is because there's a ubiquitous uh, presence of uh, radiation chambers and uh, radiation oncologists. Uh, I think that more than uh, 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 ordering lodges or head and neck surgeons, uh, that patients can 
access radiation therapy easier than surgery. And a poor proportion of major ablative procedures were stable for teaching institutions, but they went down in the non-teaching, which again uh, showed that there's some disconnect between these patients showing up at a non-teaching institution and are they not getting referred to the teaching hospital or the academic medical center uh, or, or what's going on? So a lot of questions came up when you, as you, uh, as you analyze this study. And the proportion of flap reconstruction went up for teaching institutions. And we think uh, this could be related to having seen more radiated cases where vascularized tissue is needed for a better outcome and to reduce complications such as post-operative fistulas and stuff like that. So we did do uh, another study uh, with comparison of facility type outcomes for oral cavity cancer through the NCDB and looked at uh, 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 cases between uh, over a 13 year period. Data was stratified by where the patient was treated, including community cancer programs, comprehensive community cancer programs and academic centers. And here, uh, just to make sure we know the difference and community cancer program is one that just has physicians. There's no, it's not a teaching environment. Comprehensive community cancer program is one step above where they have some teaching fellowships and residencies and academic center is one that's considered which has a whole array of teaching institutions such as University of Connecticut uh, and other institutions where they have a full, full slew of uh, uh, support and trainees and nursing and uh, bells and whistles basically. And we looked at about 32,000 patients and we saw that, you know, interestingly, majority of the patients were managed at academic cancer centers. We also found that academic, academic centers had a five-year overall survival of 51% uh, across all comers of head and neck cancer uh, and was statistically significant. So when you adjusted for confounders, patients who received care at academic centers were the positive predictor of survival uh, and it was actually a protective thing. So if you showed up at academic center, you would do well. But with the previous study, as you noted, there's a disconnect, people who need help in the major centers are unable to access it. And we started really working on the access issues at that point in time. Uh, and then came this, uh, uh, obviously this is uh, more of the data from there showing the community cancer centers have a lower percentage of patients being seen as compared to the academic centers and comprehensive community cancer centers. And then came this really big opinion piece in the Boston Globe in Boston uh, that talked about uh, disparities in management of health in a city like Boston which has some of the greatest hospitals uh, in the country. And yet there is a, a, a almost a divide uh, for patients who are sicker, maybe the elder patients, uh, patients of minority groups are unable to access the, uh, the major academic centers or cancer centers. And this was, a, this was a very well done piece. And I would encourage people to go read about it. It's pretty sad, but it opened up our eyes that within a matter of few miles, there was a big change in the demographics of the patient being managed. So then we said, okay, all this is happening. What does, how does it affect the geriatric population? Especially since we found out that the complications were not that bad in the geriatric population. It was actually worse in the 51 to 64 year olds. Are they, are they really sicker than younger patients? Or is it cost effective? What do we do with this whole geriatric thing? And this is a typical patient who, who comes to see, see us, and uh, probably a lot of you have seen this as well, patient, older patient, you know, 80, 85, uh, uh, has a big tumor in their skull base, and you're thinking, what am I going to do? Do we go into the brain? And a lot of times people say, no, you know, you're too old, let's not do it. I mean, that's what the National Health Services does in the United Kingdom. Uh, but, you know, we are a multidisciplinary society in, in the United States, and so we uh, optimize patients and, you know, do uh, uh, approaches such as a subcranial approach that's marked out on this patient. And, uh, and this is the patient uh, just four months later. You know, the tumor is gone. The cancer is gone. He's had his radiation. He's got a symmetric smile and his incisions are well. And this is only possible uh, as you think of the geriatric patient and bringing the multidisciplinary component behind them to make this a success versus saying you're a palliative care patient. You're going to go primary chemo radiation. And that's it, although it may not be the best option, it is an option. And because of your age, we're gonna, we're gonna relegate you to that. But I think the reality of things now in, in 2021 and beyond is we're gonna see a more aging population and we do need to have a holistic discussion as to uh, how we're gonna manage these patients. So in geriatrics, we again went back, looked at patients who were 66 to 100 
Uh, and we noted again that the high volume hospitals had a shorter length of stay, like we did before, uh, compared to the moderate and low volume hospitals. ICU stay and utilization was lower in the high volume hospitals. These are doing greater than 50 cases. Um, and then the mortality and average cost per case was also lower in the high volume hospital. And when you uh, use a multiple regression model, uh, major severity of disease again was associated with a higher complication rate and a high higher length of stay, uh, e even in the geriatric population. But the mortality, as you can see, was still low in the geriatric population of about 0.78%. So if, you, if done properly, an older patient appropriately screened and selected, and with the right uh, people on board and the right specialties on board, can do very well with, uh, with head and neck oncology surgery, even with the big major operations, uh, such as skull base surgery and microvascular and so on and so forth. So age should not be a reason for cutting corners or reducing the amount of treatment that you might provide to the patient. And that's what we learned from, from this study. Comorbidities, again, is important because, you know, as you get older, all of us get comorbidities. We're going to get, you know, heart disease. We're going to get diabetes, so on and so forth. And so when you look at the comorbidities profile, uh, what you saw was that uh, majority of people with comorbidities, again, ended up in moderate volume hospitals. So we start scratching ahead again. This is nuts. Uh, high volume hospitals are a better outcome, but people who are sickest are ending up in the, uh, in the moderate volume hospitals that are not managing that many people. Moderate volume hospitals have a higher complication, high length of stay, so on and so forth. And again, we saw that the most common comorbidity is similar to what we saw with everyone else, which is hypertension, metastatic cancer, COPD, diabetes, and hypothyroidism. But in the geriatric population that really opened our eyes and as we worked with our geriatric colleagues, there's additional things that you start worrying about. Iron deficiency anemia. I'll be honest with you, I, have, I was not thinking about it, but our older patient has iron deficiency anemia. I uh, had never checked anyone's, I mean, we check a hematocrit, but we never did any iron studies or anything like that on, on the older patient. Alcohol abuse is actually becoming more common in the older patient, and we think that's linked to depression and loneliness. Uh, and then weight loss or malnourishment. Uh, and all of these statistically significant. Again, we see that most of these issues end up in people who are in the moderate volume or low volume hospital. So what we concluded from this is that people who have these kind of issues are probably because of distance or whatever it is, end up in the low and moderate volume hospital. And unfortunately, because of access into the major centers, they're relegated to getting treatment over there. And that may be detrimental, as we know, based on several studies now on the outcomes and the survival. From a complication perspective, again, as expected, the moderate volume hospitals have a statistically significant high rate of complication. Uh, and you can see there's, there's various complications over here. Uh, for us, the big ones was in the geriatric population. Now we're moving, shifting gears, aspiration pneumonia. You know, a geriatric patient may be coming into our offices with silent aspiration. Now you do a major surgery on them and boom, they've got aspiration pneumonia, usually with Klebsiella. So how do you mitigate that? You know, we have a big walking program. We have a chest PT program. So all these things, all this data helps us create safety programs around our patients and in particular, the geriatric patient. But again, when you look at it, the risk overall chance of it happening is low, one and a half percent or less. But as you go into the moderate volume and the low volume hospitals, you can see that the jump is 2x, uh, at least two times the, uh, the effect. So it can really affect the survival. Other things with post-operative myocardial infarction, again, is low. Uh, I think a lot of the geriatric patients have cardiologists on board or uh, they have dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, but there in increases your chance of hematomas and stuff like that. But again, when you, as you talk to uh, uh, providers and uh, colleagues uh, who specialize in this, I think we can get a good outcome. And then the other one, two other things that we really cared about here is post-operative stroke and post-operative urinary tract complications again. And again, the risk is low, but it is, it is real, 0.26% uh, and 0.3%. So things to think about uh, as you uh, manage these patients long-term. So we concluded that again, in the geriatric population, the highest comorbidity and complications are managed by the moderate volume hospitals. And we honestly believe this is an access issue uh, that is created. Uh, why patients don't get into the academic centers? We are, we are actively researching on that. What are the barriers of entry? 
And we really need to create, improve this access to all of us. I mean, a lot of us are working in high volume uh, centers. And I think a lot of inward reflection has to happen that why are these patients not ending up with us, uh, even though a lot of us say that we manage the sickest patients, but is that really true or not? The last concept I wanna talk about, which is very pertinent to the geriatric patient is frailty. And I think this is becoming uh, uh, more widely read and popularized over the last, uh, I think five years or so, although the, the concept exists for a long time, uh, but comorbidity is defined as the presence of two or more chronic conditions or diseases. Frailty on the other hand is a physiological state of vulnerability. And this can manifest as many things. Weight loss, again, we saw that as a, as a comorbidity in the previous slides. Fatigue, you know, just feeling tired all the time. Decreased muscle mass or malnutrition. So for example, in our center, every patient gets evaluated by nutrition, uh, by, a, by, a, by a certified nutritionist and a dietitian uh, to see what's going on with their, with, with their actual muscle mass and stuff like that. Changes in gait or cognition. And this must be differentiated due to differences in prevention and treatment strategies overall have overall healthcare implications. So when you see these patients with, with a very frail, frail condition, and a lot of centers now actually have a frailty calculator. For example, our geriatric department actually has a frailty calculator right on our website so that we can put in all these things and calculate a frailty index and hopefully uh, refer the patient to the appropriate specialties to help this patient get optimized and provided the best uh, care possible. Sorry. So great article that actually came out of the uh, Johns Hopkins group uh, with uh, 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 Neiman and uh, Dr. Gorin uh, really looked at uh, uh, this frailty issue. And uh, they looked at about 160,000 uh, patients who underwent ablative surgery for malignant oral cavity, laryngeal, basically had a neck cancer over a nine year period. And frailty was identified in about just over seven, nearly seven and a half percent of the patients. And what this did was uh, that they demonstrated that uh, this was uh, associated with advanced comorbidities, Medicaid. So our older patient is going on Medicaid. So not even Medicare, they're really on Medicaid. So which means that they must be below the poverty line. Uh, major procedures uh, have, have a bad outcome. Flap reconstruction uh, happens in these folks. And high, if you're in a high volume hospital, they're actually protected uh, for their outcomes. They do get discharged, a higher chance of discharge to short-term facilities, which I think happens everywhere because a lot of these older patients may be living alone. They don't have any help. Suddenly they have to do a lot of stuff such as tube feeds, tracheostomy care, so on and so forth. And it's just safer to send them to a short-term facility or another, a different facility like a skilled nursing facility or something like that. And we all, they also identified that significant uh, frailty was a significant predictor of in-hospital death, so mortality, uh, post-operative surgical complications, medical complications, increased length of stay, and increased costs. So as you get frail, if we are not thinking about the frailty and all the different medical issues, you could run into problems, even though we showed in the previous studies that the risk of complications, such as acute MI, UTI, stroke, it's pretty low in the geriatric population if managed appropriately. And this is a very important slide because it talks about, it really educates us about what are the frailty indicators that we need to be thinking about as we assess these patients in our clinic. Because a lot of the workup, and I think a success is defined by how you manage this patient in a perioperative period. So malnutrition, you know, Severe protein calorie malnutrition. I mean, this is where you will bring in a nutritionist to assess the patient. Dementia, we're seeing more and more older patients who are surviving with dementia. We're seeing early onset dementia. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of, which comes with depression. And then you couple it up with living alone. This becomes a serious situation where you want to engage social work. Vision impairment. Uh, I don't know when uh, last time people cared about a patient's vision but this is important because if an older patient cannot walk, uh, cannot see, they will not be able to walk, which puts them at risk for the falls and so on and so forth. The cubitus ulcer, as we talked about earlier, uh, is, is a big problem. It's also a non-reimbursable condition by Center for Medicare Services. And this requires a lot of support for the patient to be able to move. Incontinence urine or, or the patient that 
you comes to your office who's wearing diapers. I mean, this is this is a red flag. You want to think about it. What's going to happen? Are they going to run into problems with uh, UTIs, uh, especially with the female geriatric patient, uh, male patient as well? Some people may have a suprapubic tube because of the incontinence or because of other issues in their urinary system. Uh, loss of weight again goes with the malnutrition part. Fecal incontinence because you know if you have someone who's fecal incontinence. Now you do a major head and neck case, you do a free flap, you get an infection with E. coli or some of the other GI bugs. And those can be very, very debilitating for this uh, group and can end up in sepsis. Uh, so how do you protect the patient? How, what are you gonna do in the post-operative arena to prevent some kind of catastrophic infection? And then as we know that more and more of the geriatric patients are becoming dependent on Medicaid, there's also the social support needs. A lot of patients may not have housing. Uh, I used to work at Boston Medical Center before. We used to have a big population of homeless cancer patients that we had to deal with. And uh, this was all part of it. Food bank. How do you get them the food? How do you get them the, uh, uh, the post-discharge uh, supplies, trach care, all that stuff. Difficulty in walking. Again, again, you can assess this in the office, but this is going to affect your post-operative rehabilitation, which again, if they don't walk enough, now you're running into the cycle of DVT and pulmonary embolism, which again can be catastrophic. And again, with the difficulty in walking, the next step becomes falls. A uh, patient can fall, hit the head, get a subdural hem hemorrhage, break a hip or so on and so forth. And suddenly uh, things become uh, very complex and complicated. So really collaborating uh, clinicians come from all the specialties. And I think uh, a lot of us collaborate in one way or the other. And I think it's very helpful. Uh, the medical specialty, especially in the geriatric patients become very critical. Uh, including nutrition, endocrinology, internal medicine, critical care, geriatrics, uh, and then obviously the rehab, dentistry, all these important parts. Uh, you start thinking about dentistry more because if you have a dentulous patient who can't chew their food, can't get enough calories, how do you get them the dentures? And unfortunately, our government and even our private payers uh, do not cover dentures uh, for the most part. So uh, a lot of these older patients have to figure out a way to pay for it. If they haven't saved it up, it's a big charge. And I hope we can change that through legislation where dental care can be covered in medical insurance or some, some other form, uh, but that becomes important. So really in conclusion, and I hope Dr. Parham have kept on time, so we'll give us time for questions. Uh, quality metrics for head and neck oncologic surgery and evolution. I think we are working uh, across institutions. Uh, uh, well, we, we have studies uh, being led by University of Kansas and uh, uh, Stanford, where we're trying to come up with different various metrics. Uh, academic medical centers uh, need to play a bigger role in managing head and neck oncologic patients. I think access is a big issue. Uh, we do know outcomes in bigger centers and academic medical centers are better than the community cancer programs. Uh, geriatric patients, which was a surprise to us, uh, have low mortality rates. Uh, they may be frail, but I think with good multidisciplinary management, we can really manage these patients and give them uh, really good care. Now, sometimes we do have to adjust our care. Like if a 97 year old person shows up with a head and neck cancer with, in, in the mouth, which bleeds every night and they can't go to sleep or they choke on it, uh, you might wanna think about how much, what extent of the surgery will you do? Are you, can you help their quality of life? Because most of these people are looking for a better quality of life. And then I've seen people who are 90 years old and uh, run six miles and uh, lift weights and are in better shape than any of us on the surgical team. And they, then you scratch your head and say, uh, I can't really deny care to this patient, what do you do? But ultimately, the bottom line is multi, uh, multidisciplinary management is critical. I think we all need to work together. We do have an aging population. We have to accept the reality uh, that uh, otorengology, I think has a very critical role to play in management of the geriatric patient through our various specialties. Uh, and I think we're very well poised. I mean, uh, everything from hearing loss to dysphagia, to cancer, uh, to uh, chronic sinus disease, uh, you know, facial aesthetics. I think this is all things that we can offer to our geriatric patient. This is Fenway Park. For those of you guys who haven't been here, so I'm coming obviously to the end. Um, so hopefully the Red Sox, I think they're doing a little bit better this year. Uh, Patriots, I have no idea, but I'm a big Patriots fan, but I don't know with... Uh, uh, maybe time to uh, root for the Buccaneers every now and then. Uh, and uh, this is our sprawling campus. We have a new building coming up uh, here as well, uh, where uh, this area is. Uh, but you guys are welcome to come visit us anytime. And I really want to thank the society 
and Dr. Uh, uh, Parham in particular for inviting me to give this talk. I hope it's been informative and uh, opens up some of the uh, treatment paradigms and perioperative workup uh, work scenarios for, for, for the people in attendance so we can make uh, care of the geriatric head and neck uh, patient safer and effective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jalisi. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, you touched on a number of very important and current, very hot topics, considering that your paper was uh, comp uh, conducted about nine years ago, if I'm correct, uh, the original paper that was submitted, uh, that was published. And it brought to fore the disparities in healthcare so uh, elegantly and effectively. Now, disparities in healthcare are, is a current hot topic, and your study uh, nearly a decade ago really emphasized how minority populations, geriatric populations have, uh, and government insurance. That, that was a very impressive uh, finding that government insurance, patients with government uh, insurance have very uh, poor access to high volume centers, which is very surprising. Uh, and, the, and, and I'm not quite sure if I understand the issues of access surrounding that. Uh, why would that be? I would imagine high volume centers, uh, because they're more efficient, they would be able to garner more of the government contracts and attract uh, more patients in that way. Uh, so can you elaborate a little bit more on why uh, this issue of access uh, persists? So I think a lot of it has to do, uh, Dr. Parham, we, we think, we, we hypothesize, is because of where people live. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, people may be living, and as you saw that a lot of the geriatric patients are going under Medicaid, which means they're probably living longer, they're exhausting their life savings, and now they're on government uh, Medicaid uh, uh, subsidies. Uh, unfortunately, I think as they move into government subsidized housing, those may be closer to a community hospital, and that's where they end up going. Uh, a lot of, as you know, I think the rise of the networks has happened. And I think a lot of people get excluded through these networks and stuff like that. Uh, and so uh, I think we need a better, more integrated healthcare systems that will accept people from one network to another if there is a better care there. Uh, but we think it's a combination of um, a, a reduced money, a p p where people live. Some people live, like for example, over here, you know, New England, as you know, you live in New England, uh, some places have no access to centers. You know, people may be like up in New Hampshire, uh, the closest hospital is Dartmouth. Uh, but if you're 100 miles north or south and don't have a car, uh, you're just going to your little, little old uh, institution close by. Now, if they do not have a contract with the big hospital, you're stuck. Uh, and I think that's where we need to really look at this. More research is needed on this topic uh, to see how we can uh, make this better. Maybe we need public policy changes. Uh, I don't know as yet, but I think it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a button that should be pushed on all of us to see how we can make this better. Yeah, another issue that you touched on very effectively was the importance of frailty. Now, uh, the data that you presented is undoubtedly instrumental into why uh, head and neck surgery in perioperative geriatric surgery assessment is considered to be relatively lower risk. Your data clearly shows that compared to, say, orthopedics or other areas. Why do you think that is? Is it because, say, orthopedic geriatric surgery commonly has to do with more um, urgent uh, situations, broken hip that needs to be managed uh, in a more urgent fashion, so there's less time for optimization and coordination of care? Uh, or are there other factors that you have considered that may be playing? No, I think, you, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think a lot of these orthopedic procedures, emergency procedures, they just have to happen. And then you pick up the pieces afterwards. For us, we are a unique specialty where, you know, most of our patients are elective patients where we have time in the peri-op phase. Uh, other specialties are not that lucky where you don't have sometimes two to three weeks to do the workup, get the scans and get the patient in send them to the cardiologist, medical doctor, all that stuff. So I think it's the nature of our specialty, which is primarily elective, even with the cancer work, unless someone's coming with a rapidly growing something where we just go, um, which makes it, I think, safer. We, we have time to optimize. Mm -hmm. 
And one more topic to highlight is that the mortality of head and neck surgery in the middle-aged population is higher than the geriatric population. That's very interesting. And, uh, can you reiterate why, so, why that is once again? Yeah, so we looked at the, comp the comorbidities and it seems, again, we, we're looking, we've been looking at this for several years now. And we think that there's a, uh, there are people who make it past 65 with very little problems. And then there are people who don't make it. And you see those patients every day as well. And I, I think it's that, that younger population, someone who maybe had an MI when they were in their 30s. And now by the time they turn 50, they have multiple comorbidities. So they end up in that severe uh, severity of illness kind of thing. And we suspect that there's, there's this group of people who get managed, they get, you utilize a lot of resources who have multiple comorbidities and get young. And the geriatric patient has already gone past that point. Maybe they started having diabetes when they are 66, 67. And before that, they didn't have a problem. And, and again, uh, more research is needed on this, but it, it really points to the point, uh, the thing that, you know, sh should, I mean, really the question that's left here is should you deny a geriatric patient appropriate care based on the age? Um, and, and hopefully in this, uh, in this talk, we figure out that the other factors you should be looking at and getting other people involved before that determination is made. Thank you. I'd like to open the floor to questions from the audience, and uh, whom I'm very grateful to for joining us this evening. Um, any questions that uh, the audience would like to pose to Dr. Jolisi? Dr. Swen. Hi, Dr. Jolisi. My name is um, John Swen, and uh, I'm an audiologist and gerontologist by background, and I'm currently studying for my PhD here at Hopkins. And uh, first of all, so I don't know anything about head and neck surgery, but I was able to track with you uh, during your presentation. So I wanted to compliment um, your, your delivery and your accessibility of your presentation. And also on a personal level, I want to express my, um, my gratitude that you spent, uh, you spent moments in your presentation highlighting disparities as an ongoing issues, as well as uh, even mentioning the concepts of social determinants of health and how that may impact outcomes in the patients we see. So I really just wanted to uh, give that feedback that I really appreciate that you included those uh, in, in your presentation today. And then I wanted to additionally add a comment to what we were just talking about, about why we see a higher mortality rates among middle-aged adults compared to geriatric older age. And I would have to expect there's um, the effects from survival bias at play here. I think um, if, I was if I was following and understanding what you were describing, I think uh, it sounds very similar to the idea of survival bias. And so I would, I would uh, that, 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 that was what I was thinking of when that question was posed by um, Dr. Parham. Great, thank you very much for your comments, really appreciate it. Thank you, John. Any other questions or comments? Wonderful, wonderful, Dr. Jelisi. This was a very eye-opening presentation. Well done. Uh, we're grateful that you uh, stepped up and uh, uh, volunteered for this presentation. And, uh, and uh, you were on our list to be invited and uh, we were able to move you up on the list uh, because of your enthusiasm. So the uh, society uh, is very, very grateful to you. Uh, for your presentation this evening. Um, I do want to add a couple of notes. Uh, our next presentation uh, will be in December by Dr. Giant Pinto, who will address uh, taste and smell disorders in geriatric population. And as you know, this, uh, this is another hot topic that relates to cognitive decline in older uh, adults. Uh, another piece of good news is that uh, hopefully, with our next uh, presentation the, uh, in December, uh, we will be able to offer CME through partnership with uh, Duke and particularly Dr. Puskas, who's uh, been a great supporter of the society and our effort to educate uh, our membership and uh, the otolaryngologists and other interested uh, healthcare providers and geriatrics with uh, regards to important topics in, in uh, older patient care. Um, so we're grateful to Dr. Puskas for her support. Uh, there will be additional uh, online seminars that will be following the December edition. Um, these will include the collaborative with, uh, with uh, Duke 
And uh, so stay tuned. Uh, there is a great uh, uh, program taking shape that, in fact, our own Dr. Swen, who just asked those, uh, who made those very insightful comments, will have a role in organizing. So with that, uh, I would like to thank everybody who joined us this evening. Uh, and uh, once again, express my deep appreciation to Sharuk Jalisi for a very insightful presentation. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Have a good night.